Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. I'm Dr. Millicent Ravello, and I'm here with my very reflective, introspective co-host today, Dr. Jay Calvert. How are you? I am very introspective and reflective <laughs> today. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. We just finished our last podcast, and there were some deep, deep thoughts coming out of you. So I don't know. You know, you're feeling it. I think what happens, you know, the there's a changing of the of the fellows at this point. Like, you know, one of our fellows is going to the other rotation, and we're getting the fellow who started on the other rotation. It's also a changing of the seasons. It is a changing of the seasons. It's, uh, you know, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things where you know you start to think like, how how can I be better? Like, how can I do better for the people that count on me? And that's a that's a big thing for me. I want to be. I want to be better. I want to be a better surgeon. I want to be a better man, a better dad, all those things. I just want to be better. So I want to be a better teacher for the fellows. And I was kind of thinking about it after hearing about like the interviews are starting and we have, we have people coming from like every part of the country to, to try to, you know, interview for our fellowship because they want to get the spot here. And so I just think, you know, I, I think about like, how can I make this even better. If we're going to take our time to do it, it should be the best it can be. It should be the best it can be. And so on that vein, we're talking about hard things, things that are hard to do. How do we teach people how to do these hard things? And what do our patients need to know about these hard operations? Our last one was one for you, cleft palates and cleft noses. The one for me, massive weight loss Mm. breasts. (laughs) And those are really... (laughs) They are really hard. But they are breasts, so they go well with champagne, which we're drinking tonight. So they are really, they are really hard. hard. They are. They're so difficult. You know, there was a point back in the day when I was kind of training where they said, "You you don't do this. Like it's just you don't put implants. You you can lift them. You could try something. Like there was just like limited, limited sort of approach to what to do with the massive weight loss breast." problem. And it is. It's a problem. So these are patients who have lost large amounts of weight for whatever reason. Maybe it's from natural weight loss, diet, exercise. Maybe it's from a surgery where they had a gastric bypass, gastric sleeve, and they lost an excess of, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100, 150 pounds. And the excess weight loss causes very loose skin. And aside from the fact that their skin is loose and things are saggy, the skin that's there is really poor quality skin. So I see this on my tummy tucks. I see it on the body lifts in these patients. I can pull these patients as tight as possible. And within a few months, things are loose again. They're not sagging so much, but they're just loose because that skin that's left behind is not good quality skin. It's like a rubber band that's lost, that's been pulled really tight and it's been stretched past its capacity and it never snaps back to the size it was before. That is the skin in these patients. And so a lot of times they present with volume deflation. They've lost the volume of breast tissue they used to have. That's a big one. And they have a lot of extra skin. So these breasts are literally looking at the ground. They're saying hi to their shoes. They are hanging out by their belly button, giving it high fives. Like these are very (laughs) long, stretchy, inelastic breasts. And of course, the patient desire is to have them look amazing. Amazing. Like they want, they they bring in. they, They want it all. And usually, usually... And everyone's different, but usually they've already had their stomach done because that's the the thing that really bothers them the most. So a lot of times they've already had a tummy tuck and now they're moving on to the breasts. So they see the great results they got from the tummy tuck and they can't leave their breasts, you know, hanging out by their belly button anymore. So they're, now they're coming in to have the breasts lifted and rejuvenated. And, and now they're on that plastic surgery train. So yeah, they want them to look amazing. Oh yeah. And sometimes they do come in with real problems, you know, because... This, the breasts are hanging down and sitting low. It's, there's a lot of t- problems with sweat and rashes that can form under the breasts. So on rare occasions, insurance will cover a breast lift or a mastopexy. And all that does really is remove some extra skin and lift the nipple, lift the areola back up into a more rejuvenated appearance placement. 
It doesn't do a whole lot for the breast, though. I mean, really part of their problem is that they've lost volume. They've lost fat. They've lost breast tissue. And so by the time you've removed all the extra skin that's hanging way down and kind of put things back up into place, someone's gone from being a double D or a triple D breast to being like a B cup because the majority of the volume that they were like stuffing into their breasts and bra cups was all extra skin. And once that skin is removed, there's very little left to actually make a breast mound. Yeah, especially if they've lost weight. You know, this is uh, this is the key is that they, the weight loss part has caused, you know, the breast to deflate. The skin is thin. It's long, like you said, just these long tubes of they, they, they don't look awesome. They at, don't. At and, the, and the nipples tend to point inward. That's another thing that happens. Yeah, they rotate. They in. rotate inward. So usually, you know, breasts. Nipples are kind of in the midline of the breast looking forward. And in, in massive weight loss patients, they actually turn inward and are kind of looking at each other. Hmm. As they say, hey, uh, five to the uh, belly button. They're not <laughs> supposed to do that. <laughs> I can tell you something about one patient I had who lost massive weight. He could actually put his breasts in his pockets. That's how long Whoa. they were. He could actually put them in in, in his, his pants in pockets. His pants pockets. Yeah, that's how long like they were. A whole new meaning to that little. What's that little ditty? Do your boobs hang low? <laughs> Do they wobble to and fro? I think it's supposed to be about the ears, but then little boys turned it into boobs. Yeah, of course. You know, that's <laughs> Can predictable. You throw them over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I just snorted. <laughs> that's how funny that was. Um, yeah. So these long breasts. And, and I, I published a paper on how to do implants in massive weight loss patients because I used to have all these patients because I trained in Pittsburgh with Dennis Hurwitz, who was like the total body lift guy. So and let's talk about that real quick because before we get to the implants, I want to talk about why implants. Um, okay. Because as you said, historically, we didn't put implants They're like, no. in patients um, because there were so many problems that came with implants. Which were... The main problem being that they don't stay where they're put. They tend to go out to the side. They tend to fall. Like we said, the skin itself is not great quality. So if you put in an implant, it tends to sag and fall out of position because the skin that's supporting it is not great quality skin. So the patients are constantly having revisions or just not having a good aesthetic outcome. So there used to be sort of a mantra that you don't put implants in a massive weight loss patient, or certainly not at the same time as a breast lift. But I think we realized going forward that a breast lift alone was not sufficient for these patients. Maybe it treated medical problems they were having, but it certainly did not give them a good looking breast. So then we delved into putting implants into patients. But again, we had those problems. They kind of stretch out the skin and you have problems with malposition and they're going towards the armpits and they're falling down again. So that brings us to solutions like you were just mentioning. Well, and, and that was my, what I thought the problem was, which is why I did this lateral breast flap thing, was I thought that they, the inframammary fold was just obliterated. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. So yeah. That, that was where I, I was like, if you don't know where the breast is supposed to go on the, on the trunk... How are you going to make a beautiful breast? Like you, no. you can't. Usually these folds, so this is the IMF, we like talk about it all the time. We have a whole podcast about <laughs> inframammary fold inframary reconstruction. inframammary fold, it's so important, especially important in implants uh, surgery. And it's that fold that delineates the breast from the abdomen. And it's supposed to be an actual distinct fold. And in these massive weight loss patients, that fold has descended so low onto the abdomen, it's like almost by the belly button and it's amorphous. It's not tight. It has no support to it. So yeah, you got to do something for it. Yeah. And that's where I, I said with the, since you had this long breast, you could take the skin from the side and deepithelialize it, take the skin, the external skin off, leave the deep skin and bring it across the chest wall, sew it to the ribs and you know, Bob's your uncle. You got yourself a, an inframammary fold, and it worked. And that's why we published it. And uh, it, I think that that started people start to think like, hey, maybe we can do implants in, in these weight loss patients. And the answer is you can. And you should. But, <laughs> but 
you got to, just like all these problems we've been talking about, you have to analyze the situation and prepare for the problems that are going to come with doing what should be a routine operation in somebody that really can't have that operation. You have to upgrade the operation. You have to provide the, and, and, and this is where you know, surgical intensity is really key. You have to have that surgical intensity to say, I need to stabilize the lateral breast pocket. I need to stabilize the inframammary fold. I need to pick the right implant for this patient that isn't gonna give the patient problems and me problems trying to take care of them. And so it's a big time analysis and planning session that will result in great results for you in these cases where great results are elusive. Yeah, there's a lot that needs, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts for these. And I like the lateral breast flap. I've definitely done that. Um, sometimes I'll use some kind of mesh, like a Galaflex mesh for additional soft tissue support. Because again, like we said, the skin sucks and it's going to stretch out. So the more sort of external additional support structures we can give to those implants, the better that it'll stay in place. So I routinely lift and reinforce that IMF to the chest wall. I'm putting in the implants. I'm doing some kind of soft tissue support for the implants, whether it's mesh or the lateral breast flap, like you mentioned. And then you got to do the lift. You got to get the implants up and over the implant, put that nipple smack dab where you want it. That's the tricky part because <laughs> it is a lot of skin that has to be removed. And you have like like just tons of skin that now is a little bit even more challenging because you're trying to make it drape around this nice round implant in a really pretty way. Without the implant, you can remove the skin, put the nipple where it's supposed to be, and like whatever you're left with is like, hey, that's, that's kind of what you got. But now when you have a beautiful round implant in there, kind of try to get all that extra skin to redrape around that pretty round implant that can be challenging as well. So there's a lot of moving parts to this surgery. And you typically need some volume. And you need volume. That's so this is this is where it's a little bit of a catch 22 because there is so much skin. Like I said, even when you remove everything that you can, there's still a lot of skin left behind and you need a larger implant to inflate that skin. If you think about like a balloon, there's a small tight balloon and there's a larger kind of inflated balloon. You need a lot more air into that larger balloon to even make a difference into the size of it. Same thing. You need a larger implant to fill out that extra skin. The problem with a larger implant is it ends up where you don't necessarily want it. It's heavy. It's going to stretch out that skin even more. So it's going to go into you know a lower position or it's going to go out to the sides. It's going to stretch out. And now you're doing a revision. So... This is why people don't put implants in because <laughs> well, they have problems. <laughs> you do, and you have a tremendous experience with Because I these. think they need it. They need they the implants, but they need to understand we're going to be back here sooner rather than later to take some more skin. And that's, that's the deal. You know, if the average person who's had a mastopexy augmentation or a lift with implants needs a touch-up or a revision every 10 to 15 years, these patients need a touch-up or revision every two to five. And that seems really dramatic, but that's sort of the truth because that's how quickly their skin stretches out again. They're still going to look way better than they did when they started, but if they want to keep that lifted, rejuvenated breast, they're going to need to come back every, you know, five years or so and tighten up the skin a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. You got to understand that this is not a routine breast augmentation. You know, it's no. just, it is so far from that. And, you know, it, it can be done well and mm-hmm. the results are great. I have a whole section on my website as well. And, but I would, I'm, I'm they should go to your website actually, because <laughs> like you're doing a lot of this. I'm doing like my fitness models. Our, our patients are so, so different. So different. <laughs> you know, and it's so funny. Cause like the other day, like uh, Dr. Orden's was he walked through my, my waiting room and, uh, you know, I had my patients who are in the waiting room and it was, you know, rhinoplasty patients and my fitness, you know, breast augmentation and breast revision patients. And, you know, my, my youngish facelift patients and, uh, and Orden comes up to me and goes, excuse me, are all those women out there here to see you? These, these good looking women that have come for for operations to make them better? I go, 
Drew, yeah, th- th- those are my patients. It's, you know, I'm having, it's Monday. This is when I see patients. And if you ever heard Dr. Orton on TV, that's exactly what he sounds like. <laughs> and then he goes, <laughs> how come everybody comes to see me 70 years old? What happened? Why do I get all the 70, 80-year-olds? I go, well, how old are you, Dr. Ward? And he goes, that's not the point. <laughs> but it is. We do tend to have patients that are our age. Our age. It's true. Of a similar personality, like gelling kind of thing. Like It's true. Plastic surgeons, maybe every surgeon, I'm not sure, but plastic surgeons for sure, we, we tend to attract you know, similar-ish patient profiles. It's true. And, you know, I, I was like, well, that they're all kind of my age, you know. <laughs> so, <they're>... Dr. Orden. <laughs> so, yeah, that's who's, you know, those, because that's what I keep saying is my patients have kind of gotten old with me. Yeah. And now they need facelifts. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of facelifts. But, you know, it was really funny. And I mean, your, your patients are your age. It's, it's really true. It's like, really if true, you look yeah. at, if you look at who's on your schedule, it is very, like every once in a while you'll have somebody in their 50s or 60s, but most of your patients are 35 to 45 years old. Yep. And and they come to you because you're their people. I, I mean, you don't have the same like body issues that, that they do. They're, you're not a massive weight loss. Wait, are you a massive weight loss I'm patient? I'm not a massive weight No, you're not. Enough. So otherwise, because like good work if you are. But <laughs> Who's your plastic that's surgeon? Right, who did all that for you? <laughs> um, but that's the thing is you wind up with patients that are your age and they, yeah. they come to you because they feel like that kindred spirit, like you understand them. And, and it's, yeah, it's because we're in the same place in life. Totally. Talk about, we talk about kids and schools and right. applications and all that stuff. And I had a patient actually the other day coming out of anesthesia. She's like... Dr. Rovello, I'm so glad you're young and close to my age because you're going to be my plastic surgeon for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's she, true. She already had like two surgeries, <laughs> maybe three. So, yeah, she was in it. It's true. I mean, uh, that was uh, – uh, I remember the article very, very well from Sophia Loren where they said, you know, they asked her, Miss Loren, how do you – how do you look so amazing? Like, what is it that, that's been your secret to your beauty? And she said, find a really good plastic <laughs> surgeon and stay with them for your whole life. God bless her. The honesty of the old days. <laughs> totally. And she was just like, Un- are you kidding me? Like, look at all this yeah, stuff I've done. This was not alkaline water and a yoga retreat. <laughs> no, it's not. And she was really honest about it. And she did have a really great plastic yeah. surgeon. She looked great for, you know. For her whole life. Her whole life. She's looked amazing. And that that is, there is something to that. There's so something f- to that. find your plastic surgeon and, and stay, stay with them with for them. your whole life. So in my world, that tends to be the massive weight loss patients because there are a lot of areas that need work. So yes, we They're do. They're going to stay with you for yeah, life. Yeah, they, they kind of are for life. And then they need the revisions like we just talked about. So the other thing we didn't address, the last thing we'll talk about on this subject and you kind of mentioned it on your lateral breast flap, is that the extra skin of the breast is not just isolated to the breasts. It extends around the side of the chest. That's called the axilla or lateral chest wall. And usually it extends to the back as well because obviously you have extra skin everywhere. It's not just in the front. So if you don't do something for that extra skin on the sides of the chest wall or on the sides of the breast or on the back, you're definitely going to have a subpar result because you may have these beautiful breasts in the front and then you have like these wings hanging off the side. (laughs) So a lot of times this is combined with an upper body lift or a bra line lift. That's an incision that goes across the back where the bra line is. And everyone's like screaming right now. But you got to understand in these weight loss patients, like they're going to have incisions everywhere. There's no good way to get the extra skin out other than by cutting it out. But this is a beautiful surgery. We'll do a separate podcast on it later. It's hidden right where that bra or the bikini sits. And it gets all that extra skin in the back. It goes around and meets the incisions in the front where the breast incisions are and gets all that extra skin on the sides. And now you you can really, really significantly narrow the width of their chest by removing that extra skin. So now their chest is a nice and narrow, and then you can really see the projection of the implants and the breast. And if you don't do it, they look like a linebacker. They look like a linebacker. They may have beautiful breasts, but you can't really see them because, like, the sides of the chest still are big and floppy. Not so cute. You got to do something. And and sometimes I do it all at once. Sometimes I stage it. It just depends on how much skin we're dealing with, if we're doing the arms as well, things like that. But you're looking at, you know, you're looking at a few surgeries. That's the bottom line. You're looking at a very complex surgery. It's going to cost more than a typical breast lift augmentation. The recovery is going to be a little more involved. And you're looking at earlier and more frequent revisions. 
not because anything has gone wrong, but because it's just that's going to be the maintenance of them. What is the cost of a lift and augmentation in a massive weight loss patient for you today, like range? Probably fifteen to 20000 I think I'm probably on the lower end in Beverly Hills. Yeah, for me, it's probably like thirty-five to 45000 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important for people to know. It's because yeah. it's not like a breast dog. It's not like a breast dog. It's not like a breast lift, breast aug combination. It's a lot more. It's a yeah. lot more work. And that's just the breast alone. We're not even talking about like if we're doing Lipo upper body lifts and... and all that stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we kind of covered that. I think we got so that. That's good. Yeah. Is there any anything else you want to add? No, that's it. Happy Friday. Why don't you take us out then? This is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.